Well, thanks so much for that wonderful reading. Question for you guys, and maybe you can tell me the answer to this afterwards. Um, when was the last time you were genuinely, really, really surprised about something? Um, I was thinking about this the other day, and um, when I was just overjoyed and really surprised was when I was about 15 years old, and I really wanted a new electric guitar. I didn't have one. All my guitar heroes had one. I was listening to all that kind of stuff. But I, all we had in the house was my mum's old classical guitar. It was all battered up. It had about four strings. They were out of tune. There was no way I could, I could practice and learn to play guitar on this thing. But my parents told me that we couldn't afford an electric guitar. So they kind of like led me along on all the months leading up to Christmas. So I was really down in the dumps for a long time. But the great surprise was when I indeed came downstairs about four o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day and I saw this uh, guitar-shaped Christmas present under the, under the tree. And to my joy and delight and surprise, I opened it and I never, never looked back. It was what got me into guitar playing. Um, I still love to play. And actually, that's one of my resolutions next year, uh, is to start playing more guitar. I've kind of put that on the back burner a bit in the last few years, but I definitely want to start playing more next year. And again, I'd be interested to know what your guys' resolutions are, if you have any. Tell me afterwards, I'd be, I'd be interested to know. But kind of a more serious question, something that, you know, goes beyond just the superficial resolutions that we make. Um, I want, and I hope you already have thought about this, but what are the spiritual resolutions that you're going to make? Uh, how are you going to make more room for God in your life? in 2018. Now I want to get straight into the readings for today. We're actually going to go to a place in the Bible which might seem a bit unusual at first, but hopefully we'll be able to tie it all together. So if you wouldn't mind, if you have a hard copy of the Bible, if you, ha if you have it electronically, that's okay too. But I want you to have uh, this verse on hand, 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'll be talking about a few of those verses, but if you could turn to 2 Samuel Chapter 7, that's a book in the Old Testament, if you didn't know. If you didn't know that, then we'll have to have a chat afterwards. Second Samuel chapter 7. And this story focuses, of course, on King David. Now, just to give you a bit of a background here, David has just won his victory over King Saul. David is now Israel's king, and he finally has rest from all of his surrounding enemies. And so, in response to what God has done for David, David decides to do something special for God. He wants to show his gratitude for God. So, in 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 and 2, you'll read, After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, this is David talking, he says, here I am living in this house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. You know what we mean by that tent, right? It's the sanctuary that was set up and taken down in, in the wilderness. That was where God was residing at the moment. And David didn't feel good about that. David feels guilty because he's living in this luxurious, uh, really wonderful palace. And God is living in this mobile tent. And so David decides he wants to build a temple, wants to build a house for God. Sounds like a nice thing to do, yeah? Sounds like a good plan. But interestingly, God is not actually thrilled with that idea. And so then God responds to David through Nathan, the prophet, and in verse 5 you'll read, Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, and God's talking sort of with a bit of irony here. God says to David, should you build me a house to dwell in? See, God informs David here that David doesn't need to do anything for him. And God kind of interestingly turns the tables, explaining that it is he who is going to establish a house for David. Now, there's kind of a word play going on here. God obviously doesn't mean he's going to establish a literal house for David. No, God is talking about establishing a royal house for David, uh, a family line that will succeed him. And it's interesting, isn't it? Here's David 
so focused on what he can do for God, he completely forgets that really the spiritual life is all about God's grace. It's not about what you can do for God. It's about what God has already done for you. God is always the one who initiates first. God is always the one who offers his grace before you've done anything to deserve it. So what does God do? Well, as we said, he makes this promise to David. He uh, promises David a long family lineage that will continue to rule long after David has gone. In verse 16, in the same chapter, it says, God again promising to David, your house and your kingdom will endure for how long? Forever. Forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. That is the expectation that David had. This everlasting kingdom. As you think about that expectation, what about your own life? What are the expectations that you have for your own life next year? And will God be faithful in keeping his promises to you? Now, things didn't work out very well for David. King, uh, the, 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 the kingdom lasted for about 400 years. It's a bit of a history kind of lesson here, which is a really long time. That's a good innings, isn't it? 400 years, pretty good. But David's kingdom did not seem to last forever. As you may or may not know, in the year uh, 586 BC, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem, destroyed it, took the Israelites into captivity. David's royal house had come to an end. God's promise of an everlasting future was left unfulfilled. Do you ever feel like God's promises for you are unfulfilled? Maybe all those prayers that you offered up in 2017, maybe they still haven't been answered. Maybe you're still stuck in a job that you hate. Maybe you still haven't found that life partner. Maybe you're still really struggling to make ends meet financially. Maybe you've just lost all sense of direction in your life. Maybe you're still suffering from loneliness, brokenness, anxiety, depression, and you ask yourself, where is God? Why isn't God fulfilling the promises that he made to me? Well, you know what? I'm sure every Jew asked themselves that question as they reflected on losing their home, on losing their land, losing their possessions, losing their family, I'm sure when the Jews looked around and saw their oppressors ruling over them, they asked exactly the same thing. Where is God? And let's be honest, sometimes we don't feel like we know where God is, do we? Sometimes God does seem silent. Sometimes God does seem non-existent, distant feels like our prayers are falling on deaf ears. Sometimes it feels like they're falling on no ears. But here's the thing. Even when they didn't know where God was, even when they didn't understand quite what God was up to, they never lost their faith. Even when their everlasting kingdom that didn't seem so everlasting even when that kingdom was shattered, even when everything they were experiencing in their life and their circumstances suggested that God had failed them, they continued to remember the promise that God had made. And interestingly, most scholars say that the book of 2 Samuel was actually written a lot later than the story that it tells, written in the 6th century, written while the Jews were in 
captivity in Babylon. Get the point? Right in the middle of their suffering, the Jews decided to write about God's promises. They decided to tell stories about God's promises. They decided to remember and have faith in God's promises, no matter how things around them seemed. So maybe that's exactly where you are in your life right now. A really low point for you, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe you're still waiting expectantly for God's promises to take fruition in your life. Well, then I can tell you, friends, Christmas is the time for you. Because, as our reading told us uh, earlier, you skip forward 600 years, it's a long time to wait, 600 years forward in history from the time of Babylonian captivity, Israel still has no king, Israel is still estranged from God, still under foreign rule, still oppressed, still hoping for an everlasting kingdom, and still waiting for God's promise to come true. But then, all of a sudden, God does something. God intervenes. God sends his angel to a virgin, engaged to a man named Joseph. Now, if you look in the passage of the scripture we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 27, you'll see what jumps off the page as Joseph is introduced. Joseph is not just some guy. Joseph is not some random man. It says that Joseph is from where? The house of David. See, when you know a little bit about the history, you'll notice just how important that small remark is. God is not just enacting some brand new miracle. No, God is fulfilling the 600 years old promise that he made to David, bringing a new king into the world who will rule over Israel and rule over every nation. See, God hadn't forgotten his promise at all. In fact, God was always fulfilling it, but he was doing so quietly, clandestinely, hiddenly, slowly, but now, at Christmas time, the time was right for the promise to find its true fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. See, we don't always see what God is up to, but God is always up to something. And the season of Advent, the season of Christmas, it reminds us to wait faithfully for God's promises to be fulfilled. And it also reminds us that God's promises are often fulfilled in rather unexpected, unpredictable ways, doesn't it? Now you, you probably have an exact idea in your head, right, about how God needs to answer your prayers next year. But I'm wondering, and speaking for myself as well, I'm wondering if some of our ideas for our prayers being answered, I wonder if some of those ideas need to be, need to be modified, need to be changed a little. Because yes, God fulfills the promise to put an everlasting king on the throne. But notice how unpredictable that fulfillment is. Because Surely the king of Israel should arrive with power. But Christ arrives as a helpless, naked baby. And the king of Israel should arrive with money. Christ arrives as the son of a peasant family. His father a carpenter and his mother a 13-year-old nobody about as low as you can get on the social scale. And surely the king of Israel should arrive with recognition. But Christ doesn't come to Jerusalem, the religious, the political, the cultural center of the world. 
No, Christ arrives in Nazareth, that dirty, poverty-stricken town of which it was said, nothing good can come from Nazareth. Friends, if Christmas means anything, it is that God fulfills his promises in ways you could never predict. So I can't tell you what next year will bring. I don't know. Maybe some of the things you've been praying for will be answered. Maybe other prayers you'll just have to be more patient with. But I guarantee a lot of your hopes and dreams for yourself will be answered, but in unexpected ways. But just know God never forgets you, and he is answering you in his own time and in his own way. So what can you do? Well, what you, the one thing you can control is your attitude. It's your stance before God. And I think in, in, in that sense, I think Mary in the story is the perfect example for us. Why is she the perfect example? Simply because Mary is completely open to God's action in her life. Verse 35 says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So if you want to have a, a deep and lasting joy in 2018, that's what it's all about. Letting God's Spirit overshadow you. Is that something you're willing to do? See, it's Mary's openness, her willingness to let God use her, 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 her willingness to cooperate with God's will and to put her future entirely in his hands. That's what makes Mary such a shining example for us. Lastly, Mary says in verse 38, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Do you have the courage to say the same thing next year? Do you have the courage to say, I am a servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Do you have the courage to say, God, I'm going to put my own expectations on hold next year. and I'm just going to embrace your faithfulness to me and be open to you fulfilling your promises in my life, in new, unexpected, unpredictable ways. And God, I want you to do that on your terms, not my own. That, I think, is the stance that we need to take next year. It's not about getting what you want. It's not about having your agenda agreed to by God. It's about living your life with this extreme and radical openness to God, simply letting God be faithful to you and allowing him to fulfill his promises to you in unexpected ways. I hope that's a message that we can all uh, take in our hearts today as we look forward to a new year. And I invite you, just before we close, to stand and let's sing with joy our closing hymn.